Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of DXE-sponsored seminars and webinars. This today is around agile banking, and I'm delighted to introduce my guest, Lisa Wood, Chief Marketing Officer of Atom Bank. And in the empty chair is soon to be David Weldon, Chief Marketing Officer of Royal Bank of Scotland. David's held up in, in traffic at the, at the moment. So, uh, Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do today is really get your views and your insights and your thoughts into not just agile banking, but how the world around us is reshaping uh, the banking business, how it's reshaping how you market to your customers, how it's reshaping the underpinning technologies and, and strategies of how you keep your brand relevant and, and, and obviously gain market share. So we're going to spend the next 30 or so minutes discussing that. And um, firstly, before we sort of jump into that, mm -hmm. could you maybe tell our viewers a little bit about Atom Bank and yourself and, and what your role is within the organization? Yeah, sure. Um, so Atom Bank is a new digital only bank. Um, we uh, exist on apps, so you can use us on your smartphone, your mobile phone, or your tablet. Um, we were founded in 2014. Um, we really saw the sort of growing uh, rise of people uh, being very, very happy interacting with their bank on, on mobile devices. Um, and, you know, our, our vision is to create the world's most customer-centric bank. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, we offer savings and mortgages, um, and we are busy squirreling away, uh, building out a wider way, range of products, um, and we, uh, we also um, offer loans to uh, SMEs as well, so mm -hmm. business customers as well. Um, so, you know, we, we very much intend to be a full-service bank um, existing on your mobile device for uh, retail and business customers. That's a really interesting point, a full-service bank yeah. on your mobile. Yeah. And we believe you absolutely can do it. Um, you know, the way in which you design your bank is absolutely critical to make sure uh, that you know, it's easy for you to interact with your bank, but actually uh, we don't see why, why you can't do that. You know, more and more people these days are only interacting with their banks, either on, uh, through the internet, on, on, the, on the browser, or actually through their apps. More and more are just actually doing the apps. So it's very important that you have a fallback position in terms of someone to talk to when you, things go wrong. Um, but absolutely, why not? Mm. So, given given you're the you know you're leading, you're responsible for the brand at yes. Bank, and you're going to be responsible for driving you know more full service capabilities through effectively a digital channel. Yeah. How important is yeah, either the changing relationship to you between the consumers and banks generally post two thousand and eight? There is a changing uh, viewpoint societally, I think, around financial services and banks and the role of banks. Yeah. So uh, can you maybe share with us some of your thoughts about how you are going to re keep the brand relevant whilst at the same time moving with those different consumer behaviours and buying patterns? So I think, you know, I think the one thing to recognise about banking is it, it is for, for the vast majority of people, it's a functional thing. Mm -hmm. It is a low interest category that you know, people have to use a bank uh, to get stuff done, to buy things, to put the money in, to keep the money yep. safe. Uh, but generally, it is a, a low interest category. Um, and so, um, you know, moving people and, and making sure that you've got something that is highly functionally, functional, you know, highly attuned to the way in which they want to manage their money um, and developing that on digital technology is actually a relatively straightforward thing to do, mm, mm. particularly if you're listening to the customer and you know yeah. what the customers want. Yeah. Um, you know, people are, some people are still using branches um, mm -hmm. and, and they're great for some interactions for some customers. But I think we're really, really clear at Atom that, um, you know, we're not for all customers. If, if you want to manage your banking and do it in a way that's highly convenient for you um, and saves you lots of times and it's really easy to do, then Atom's for you. Uh, and that's the service that we'll design for you um, and personalise to you. Mm. Um, but if you want a branch and, and that face-to-face -face relationship is really important, 
then a high street bank is, you know, is probably where you'll go. That's a really interesting point. Maybe if I can stay with that yeah. in terms of um, the aspiration to be a full service bank whilst being completely through the mobile app, that obviously brings some challenges with yeah. it. And we see it every day in DXC. You know, we provide uh, a number of the technology services to large financial institutions. And one of the areas that comes back time and time again is security. Yeah. If you're going to provide those services, which, which cannot go down, they can't, you know, and we've read a lot in the press about how susceptible brands are to security breaches. Can you maybe share with the viewers how you as a leadership team at Atom think about security as it relates to digital, as it then relates maybe to the, to, to the way that you culturally approach that yeah, issue? I mean, you know, for us, security is the starting point for designing whatever it is that we're putting out there into the world. You know, if, if we're a digital brand and we want to uh, build our credentials and trust with consumers, then the first thing that you have to be, if you are a bank, you have to be secure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the way in which we're thinking about security is just you know, make it as secure as it possibly can. So, you know, we think of ourselves as, as, as always, um, you know, security is changing a lot as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep pace um, yeah. with security. So always keep pace. Uh, always strive to be best in class. That's the way in which we think yep. about security. Uh, it's an evolving thing. Um, but make it easy for customers. So, for example, you know, we've put biometrics into our app. So we know that from, a, from a, uh, an access perspective, people you know, don't like passcodes mm. or passwords. Um, and certainly with a lot of banks, you get the little two-factor devices as well that come yeah. along with it. Yeah. Um, and, and that becomes an irritation for people because it's a blocker and it makes it difficult for them to get into the bank. What we've done is we've put in biometric security. Um, so we've partnered with a best-in-class biometrics provider um, and you can use your face or your voice as well as a passcode. Mm. We still have that option, but you can use that to get into your bank. So it makes it really easy. You are your own identity as you get into the bank. And generally, you always have you with you yeah. when, uh, when you're going into your bank. So, you know, it makes it really, really easy. Um, I think the other thing, the way in which we're thinking about security as well, is that, uh, again, as we progress and as we uh, bring more products on stream, um, is that actually um, we also recognize that different people have different uh, different um, relationship with security. Yeah. So <laughs> some people are really, really risk averse, uh, and some people are a little bit more relaxed. Now there will always be a minimum standard yeah. that, that because we're protecting the customer. But you know, you could actually, as a customer, choose to be put down all the locks that you you know at an individual security level. Um, if we, you know, if we offer that functionality within our within our app and within our service, so that's one of the things that we're thinking about is, you know, how how do you actually tailor security as well, minimum standard, which is always sort of best in class, but actually then let the customer choose how locked down they want to be, as well for certain things. Interesting. Can you can you elaborate a little bit on what process you go through internally to design that kind of tiered service? For the customer, where security is concerned, is there is there a uh, a full scale debate with all the areas of Atom Bank involved, so, given, given its importance? So yes, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's great because Atom Bank is three hundred and fifty employees. Yeah. So we're not a huge organisation. We're quite a significant mm. organisation, uh, but the way in which we will design out what we're doing is, you know, you've got a, a propositions team. Uh, that's looking at it from a customer angle yep. and, and saying, what do we want to offer as a proposition? And, you know, in that respect, we're looking at, well, what, what, how do customers think? How do they feel about things? And, you know, what do they want generally? Um, we have our head of customer experience who is an integral part of that process. Um, uh, we build customer feedback loops into every single touch point at Atom. Um, so we know all the time what people are thinking and feeding back to us uh, about the bank. Uh, we know if they're ringing us, what their issues and concerns are, and we take all that and we feed that into the development process. So we've got uh, customer experience that is giving us all that insight. So we go, okay, 
how are we designing out mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our proposition in the context of that customer insight. Um, and then we have a development team, we have uh, designers, and we have um, security who are all then part of that process of saying, how, how are we bringing that security proposition to market? And they all sit together within the same organization. Fantastic, yeah. yeah, and I yeah. think that's, that's probably a key point now. Yeah. Welcome, Thank David. You. How are you? Hi, David. <laughs> I'm, Chris, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm late. So sorry. No, no, nice no. Uh, yeah. David Weldon, uh, Chief Marketing Officer of Royal Bank of Scotland. So, David, welcome. Please take a drink. It's uh, it's a lot of traffic out there as well. So, anyway, enough of that. Here <laughs> welcome. You're here now. You're here now. So, we just kicked off, and I was really um, explaining, you know, over the next sort of 30, 35 minutes. Um, really want to get both your viewpoints on how you know, your organizations are being reshaped by what's going on out there in terms of the digital world. Um, reshape both internally and externally, not just with your customers, but clearly it's having probably uh, an effect on the way you think about organizing yourselves. And uh, Lisa and I have just been talking about um, Atom Bank in the sense that given everything that it does is, is, is through the app and it's online and, and therefore security is clearly a key criteria and it's built into the, the fabric of the way that they operate with other or, uh, departments. And, and I suppose to, to that vein, um, you know, Royal Bank of Scotland um, as an organization is going through its own transition uh, post 2008 and post obviously the government, you know, that's it's a government ownership. Um, how, how for you as, as, as sort of the owner of the brand, how important is the security aspect to that's you? Massively important, uh, probably the single most important thing in that I'm afraid there's no bank that no. knows better how important it is to keep <laughs> everything safe and secure. And as you know, we've only just passed the 10 year, um, I won't say celebration, but the 10 year anniversary of the collapse of the bank. First time we've made a profit, first time we've paid a dividend. And last year we focused on making sure everybody understood that this bank is now safe and secure from yeah. a capital perspective, first and foremost, from a your money is safe and secure and increasingly, of course, your data is mm, safe and secure yeah. and, and probably in, in an era when people should be more worried about data privacy than they actually are, I think it's great to see that banks are trusted again, trusted to keep people's yeah. data safe and secure. So on, on, on the notion, to, this is a question to both of you, on the data privacy, um, is, that, is that something that comes up daily within your, 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 your internal meetings, external meetings, your design? Is it, is it, is it how, how how far up the list is that for you when you're designing new products and services and so on? After you, Lisa. <laughs> well, I mean, data for us is, is going to be a big part of how we think we can add value back mm -hmm. to customers. So yep. I think, you know, our view is very clearly that banks have a huge amount of data. Um, and I don't think they've particularly used that data well to play it back to customers. Um, in a useful way, in a relevant way, that helps them manage their money. And I think you, what you're starting to see now, particularly with the digital banks, is that that, that data being used in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly when we're thinking about how we're designing our propositions, we are thinking about it in multiple layers. We're thinking about, well, what are the products and the features and the services mm -hmm. that we have to offer our customers? And then we look at a next layer, which is how do we enrich that experience yeah. Um, with the data that we've yeah. got and, and, and use that data to be useful and relevant to customers. And then at the top, top, top sort of layer is and what does that customer experience feel like and look like and how easy is it to use? Yeah. So there's you know, multiple layers now that when you're designing a bank that you really have to think about. And mm. it is, mm. data is absolutely integral to the bank that we're going to become. Yeah. And David, I, I guess... The well, likewise. I mean, I, to, to answer your question, mm. yes, I mean, we're... We are now obsessing about customers um, and you know, in a way that perhaps we can, given that we've left the sins of the past behind us, more or less. We're really focused on that and, and it is a daily subject. We were talking mm. about the impact of GDPR this morning, for instance, and, and particularly when it comes to another bit of this, which is what is digital done to marketing uh, and how it's impacted <laughs> there. And that's not a pretty picture. Um, uh, but you know, actually what we really look at mm is making the data work harder for the people that own it and that's mm. our customers. So it's a, you know, this, the privacy data is, I think is great for customers. Um, open banking, mm. when it plays its way through, should also be great for customers at the moment. That's in its early days, um, but yes, yeah. crucial. 
And so I think, I think as well that customers are just starting to realise that their data has value. Yeah. So I think mm. we've gone through you know, a number of years where people have given data away quite freely. Um, and then, you know, with a whole load of uh, awareness around GDPR and data breaches, I think consumers are waking up to the fact that actually data is a value commodity to a mm. number of big organizations. Yes. And therefore, I need to think about it a lot more. And I think GDPR has done a really good job of that. But I think, again, customers should own their own data and they should be able to monetize their own data. Um, mm -hmm. And I think organizations which um, enable that are, are the ones that kind of will win with customers in the future. I agree with that. So, you know, some, some very you know, key and important points you both brought out there. Um, if I could just explore the open banking issue a little more. Um, I guess, what, what's your view on what customers understand by open banking? And I suppose the second question would be, how do you in your respective organizations uh, feel you are positioned for, for, for their open banking future and, and clearly you know, do you have a view and maybe share with folks how you think that can create advantages and sometimes some threats um, to, to what you currently do? Well, I, mean, I think the, you know, first of all, we're in the foothills of open banking as a sector, I think. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and I do think, you know, this is one of the things I'm envious of a small startup digital <laughs> bank because it must be easier yeah. because, you know, we have a we have a big beer moss to turn around. But, you know, what we're doing first and foremost is making sure we comply with all the regulations to your aunt, to your question about customers. The first site is customers were frightened by it. They didn't know what it was. And actually, there's bits of open banking that is at odds with what we've been telling our customers. Don't give your sign in details to anybody yeah. because we wouldn't want you to get defrauded and then all of a sudden they have to do it. So this phase will work its way through because when you explain to people that down the track it will add value and I think this is where trust is absolutely fundamental to the bank that you trust and the bank that gives you the best rates, um, you know, you will, we will all do well by doing that. Um, so I think we're very well positioned as we weave through this, but as I say, um, I, I look not. I, I look and go, thank goodness, it must be, <laughs> must be great for you to be driving it harder. I mean, are you driving it harder? Are you finding it easier? Because, of course, you, you're starting and going up as opposed to reversing. Yeah, but I mean, as you say, there's still, there's a lot of regulation that needs to be met yep. to actually, you know, really enable uh, open banking infrastructure. Yep. Huge amount of regulation. So, you know, we're working through that at the moment. I think from um, a customer perspective, I, I, I think you have to show them the way on yes. open banking. You know, if you went to, you know, general man on the street and mm. said, what do you think about open banking? They wouldn't have a clue. Uh, mm. And, and mm. open banking as a terminology, I think is a bank out construct. Um, I think what you've got to do is be able to show customers actually the benefits that that's going to bring them and what they're going to be able to do mm -hmm. as this thing takes hold and, and, and as more banks start to participate um, and, and more organizations start to participate as well. So I think, you know, we, we've done um, plenty of research, I'm sure you have in this space, but, you know, if you show customers the benefit of, well, you can bring everything together in one place and see all your finances in one place and you'll be able to, you know, easily sort of work out the best deals for you and all they love that they kind of go oh yeah i'll have a bit of that mm. thank you very much and if you're going to help me manage my money and tell me how to make more of it yeah big tick but you're going to have to show them they're yeah. not then it, it's going to be you know it's like any adoption curve mm. is that you will have a few that understand it and start to it, you know it, it will be hard work i think to start to construct yeah. an open banking world from a consumer for yeah. a little while yeah, and I think especially show the way. Mm, because at yeah. the same time, you know, if you look at the rise of digital fraud um, and actually, you know, yeah. digital advertising fraud is one of the fastest growing crimes in the world. So yes. you know, we, we have to educate people about scams on the one yeah. hand and educate them about keeping their data safe and secure and then sell them yep. the advantages of giving <laughs> away their data to other people. Yeah. So yeah. This, it, there yeah. is a, you know, we, yeah. we have to tread carefully through this, I think, and, and take mm -hmm. time to make sure that customers understand what they're getting into and, and we help them and educate them. But I do yeah. think the, you know, it'll be great when it's worked its way through. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I think our view is, you know, it's, it's gonna be a good two to three years before it really starts to have an effect from a, a customer sort of benefit perspective. Yeah. 
And that would be you, you, your sense as well. Would it? I think so. I mean, uh, you know, we're not counting on it because mm. change, you know, is happening ever faster and it could happen mm. faster than yeah. that. And, and actually, yeah. I mean, if you actually look at what are the propositions. So, yes, people have got aggregation and you can see all your finances in one place. But so what? Yeah. You know, so well, what you've can, been able to can, do that for a number of years, yeah, really, yeah. haven't you? Yeah, what can you do with it? How is it yeah. a benefit? Uh, and actually, I think people are correctly demanding more because after all, you know, we live in a world where apps do astonishing things for people mm. and you know banking yeah. apps which once led the pack are now kind of dropping back yes. because the experience of other apps is getting incrementally better all the time so we're in a hurry to make it work for our customers i think yeah. i think you know you you mentioned their data and i think data is the key to unlocking it if if there can be if you can show that there's a real value mm. in bringing together your accounts and sharing that data together because someone is going yeah. to unlock some value in that for you then you'll do it. Yeah. But it's actually data that is, I think, the, the unlocking thing, as opposed to open banking per se. Yeah. And I, I, sorry, David. Well, it is. And also, you know, the, this is people don't want to be sold things. They want things that are of benefit for them, yeah. that are going to help them wherever yeah. they are in their economic life cycle, life yeah. stage. Yeah. And actually, because of the history, especially the history that's mm. hung heavy over us, we're very cautious about making sure we do things in the right way. Yeah. Um, yes. And I don't, I'm sure you're doing exactly the same, but I don't think it's easier if you're a startup, but you know, yeah. the, uh, you in, know, the horizon is clearer. Yeah. yeah, and we've not got the brand credentials sitting behind us. In, in some ways that's a good thing and it's a bad thing because we've not got the legacy, but equally we have got to build that, that credibility and trust with, with the yeah. consumer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the challenge is the same. It's just, I think, between the, the two respective organizations, there's clearly, as you say, you're coming with, with without the legacy where, yeah. I think, David, you, 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 you're into so many markets, whether it's retail banking, whether it's investment, whether it's mid-market, mm -hmm. at, at scale with trying to meld the old and the new yeah. um, to, to create that customer relevance, right. which mm -hmm. is a... Exciting times. It's no easy yeah. task, no, indeed. It's, it's <laughs> great, so, a great time to be doing yeah. it. I don't want to lose um, track of this question about data. Because you know, uh, you know, certainly in, in what what we do in DXC for a living, you know, we we are coming constantly in all industries back to the point that the data is king, and organising around data mm. is really going to enable and unlock innovation. It's going to al allow organisations to position their products and services in a more relevant way to to your earlier point, David, to, to customers rather than forcing yeah. it on customers. Um, can you maybe share with with the viewers? Um, your own experiences of, of how your own organizations have had to change a little bit to enable that data to be freed up internally to start creating new products and services because a lot of what isn't just a technology issue you know, this is as much for me a cultural issue and as much an organizational issue as anything else and, and certainly although you the, the size of both of your respective organizations are, are different I, I, I would like to hear when well, maybe we have similar challenges with 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 having to constantly change to take advantage of, of releasing the data. Yeah, I mean, I, at risk of being controversial, I, mean, I think it's no. a bit of a red herring of a question. Okay. Because data has always been important. It's come mm -hmm. in different forms. Yep. You know, now, now, what we've got today, of course, is real-time data, transactional data, yep. first-party data, which you can match mm -hmm. with third-party data and do all sorts of incredible mm -hmm. things to extract value for the person that yep. matches the end customer. And actually, that's the dialogue that we force internally. Yeah. Now, enabling it is altogether tricky, mostly because, you know, as I often say, the most difficult thing about business is it involves human beings. <laughs> so the, <laughs> yeah. so you know, yeah. trying to kind of get people to yeah. configure and get used to a changing world is, is tricky and it's challenging. But, you know, I, I think that's what makes what we do exciting. Actually. Yeah. So, you know, what we're finding is we're more and more challenging ourselves to do a better job for our customers. There's a good open dialogue uh, around how to do that more effectively. Mm. It's a we thing, not a me thing. So, you know, yep. we have to do this together. Um, and, but it's not easy. Mm. <laughs> no, and especially that. if customer centricity is at the heart of your strategy, then to organize more and more relevant products and services around the customer yep. probably requires data needing to be shared across boundaries where it hasn't been shared yeah, before. Yes. And I, th I think yeah. the cultural thing is a really interesting mm. point, actually, is that I, th I think to be uh, a really successful digital business and customer-centric business, you have to have an open culture of collaboration. Yeah. 
And I think for us, that's a lot easier than, you know, I've worked in sort of corporate world as well. It's a lot easier in this world for me than it ever was because, because you know, you've got big departments and they, they don't necessarily always work together. Mm. Um, but, you know, for us, creating that collaboration where your data analysts and scientists are literally uh, sparking ideas for proposition and how you can bring that to customers is going to be critical. You know, because what you've got to do is you've got so much data, mm -hmm. you have to be able to unlock really useful and timely insights. Exactly. If you can't be useful and timely, there's not a lot of yep. point in unlocking that insight. So actually being able to collaborate uh, around the customer, I think is really, really critical. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and in our case, you know, what I would say is that is, you know, our culture is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it needs to change faster. And actually when I look at our, our view scores, that's how we measure things, despite everything that's happened to us, you know, we're at an all time high. And one of the things that's growing is people's belief in collaboration to deliver a better customer outcome. Yeah. Um, now that's easy sentence to say, still difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. you know, I th how many people yeah. have you work in Atom? 300 and change? 350-ish. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, you know, we're just, the, we're just the 70,000 and change. Yeah. So that's, yeah. it's a bit more difficult to configure, but not, not doable. And I think it's done by, you know, having a real customer obsession throughout yeah. the yeah. culture yeah, and not being critical. afraid to challenge each other on that as well. Mm. And you, you've seen that, is that developing at quite a pace, that different, different cultural yeah. attitude? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and we're impatient for it to develop faster, but the, you know, uh, so far so good is what I would say. Superb. Yeah. So in terms of innovation, because that's, that's another big area now that we hear a lot of, and the constant need to innovate either through products or through service. Um, do you, can you maybe share with you what your strategies around innovation are? Do you, do you go alone? Do you go with partners? You mentioned earlier about um, you know, partnering around a particular a piece of software or a particular data company to bring them into your own mm. ecosystem. Um, you maybe share with us a little bit about your thoughts around how you're going to increasingly innovate when faced with still some of the challenges. Yeah. Um, I mean, for, for me, uh, innovation works on so many levels. Mm. Um, so I think it just has to be, again, built into the culture of an organization to innovate. Um, there's a number of things that we do at Atom. Um, we have very close partnerships mm -hmm. uh, with, we are uh, very blessed with having two amazing universities on our doorstep because we're, yep. we're based up in Durham. We have Durham University and we have Newcastle University. And actually we have a, a, a number of other uh, educational institutions as well. But um, we have a number of very active partnerships yep. um, mm. with uh, uh, and funded projects with the universities, which are really, really tapping into, uh, you know, particularly um, data, AI, blockchain, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of um, new, the, the sort of new and up and coming yep. technologies piece that actually academia can help really bring, well, the, the partnership between the two can help bring academia into practice. So we've got a number of those partnerships. Um, we also look externally for partners, you know, and, and people who can add value to our business. Um, and then I think innovation on a daily basis, um, because innovation should be something that is constant, yeah. is I think just as much about um, understanding uh, what it is that you have to iterate and do next and, and constantly um, changing and updating your app, your proposition, to, to actually bring that customer insight into your organization, but as part of your development cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's hugely innovative in its own right. And I think, you know, from, from an Atom Bank perspective, that, that's woven in, in terms of your, um, those partnerships, and as I said, yeah. on your doorstep. I mean, David, clearly we're talking about 70,000 strong but we do, I mean, we do all of the above. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do the same thing. Some mm -hmm. things we do ourselves, other things we partner externally. We yep. too are on the doorstep of some great universities, yep. work with them. I think we're particularly proud of the way we have a scouting network to find things yep. on the West Coast and Israel, find things we can work together. So we embrace FinTech and partner and work with them as well. And we've had some great success at doing that with Esme, for instance, I'd cite for that. But, the, you know, in general, we're focusing to use the buzzwords at the edge and, and in the core. Um, <laughs> and actually we've got to focus 
innovation on our customer base. Yep. So that's, you know, if I turn that into a brand, you know, what are NetWest doing to innovate? So we're very proud. We've got the first paperless mortgage in the yes. in the marketplace. So that on the mm. one hand. On the other hand, we've got Esme on the outside. We've got, you'll have read about it, our standalone digital bank, Bo, which yep. is a um, work in progress, which we're delighted with the progress so far. And I should warn you now, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> so you know, so yep. We're, yep. we're innovating wherever we can. But I also, I wouldn't like to lose the... It's really also important to innovate on the tiny things. So yeah. innovating yeah. on queue management, for instance, mm. in a branch, yeah. and, you know, yeah. how to make a customer's yeah. life easier, because sometimes you are going to have to wait for 10 minutes. Absolutely. But if you know that, you can go off and do something else, and then you'll get a text to yeah. say, we're ready now. That's great. So we're, we're innovating on the tiny things as well as the big things. Uh, and we have a kind of mindset of innovation, which I think is probably the most important thing. Um, and that's also tricky to change. But... You know, if you go backwards, a lot of banks chose to go, we can do all this ourselves. We don't need any help from the outside. Yeah. That's not true. You know, the world yeah. we're in now, we all need yeah. help and we all need to partner and configure yeah. in ways that are challenging as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, coming back to the fact that you're, you're both, you know, chief marketing officers for, 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 for brands, ultimately in the financial services space. How has that partnering affected you both in the way that you approach your own roles and your own teams? in terms of how, how you encourage that. I mean, there's some examples of maybe how you, you yourselves mm -hmm. have, have changed the, maybe the way that you go to market around certain products and services with partners. Is there any good examples of that over the last year or so? Well, I mean, difficult to say any good examples, but the, you know, the, I, th I think everything's different yeah. now. So, you know, if I, let's, let's use the world of media, it's mm -hmm. quite interesting to sit and talk directly because we're sitting in their offices. Yep. Let's do it to the Telegraph about how we'd like to work with them on a program for women in business. Once upon a time, we'd have done that yep. through a brief yeah. into a media agency yep. and outside. Yeah. So the whole yeah. business is a word I hate. The whole business <laughs> ecosystem is changing and we have to change with it. Yeah. Now, the disciplines, I think, are the same and the rigor is the same. But, you know, having the ability to learn something new every day and having other people open to that is, is probably the thing I've enjoyed most about this. So and if I go back, because I started quite a long while before you, <laughs> And I didn't start in financial services. You know, there was a way that yep. you did marketing yes. and a way that you built brands and not quite a textbook, but in a way that happened. That's all changed. Uh, and you have to be open to the change, but whilst not forgetting the customers at the heart of it all. Absolutely. And, and, and would I be correct in thinking that with that sort of changing relationship with the customer through data and everything else, you've had to maybe bring a little more, marketing has become more of a, a technology discipline. Is that a fair, fair yeah, statement I mean, to make? Yeah. yeah, a science and an art. Um, mm. so that, yeah. you know, yeah. and the two together. Yeah. The two together. And actually MarTech, you know, needs to fuel all sorts of things in a way that didn't. So technologically enabled, definitely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we like to think of things as, rather than talk about digitizing them, automating. You know, we think yeah. we should automate everything we possibly can uh, because our future is going to be high tech, high touch. You yes. know? So on the whole, customers don't really particularly want to talk to their bank. If they don't need to if it's seamless and it works perfectly. But when they want to, they really want to and you have to have great human yeah. beings. Um, so you need both. I think I think Lisa mentioned at the start um, that, you know, it, it, it's a it's a low priority purchase at times oh, it is. and therefore yeah. You know, you you have to you have to work around that, and that was an yeah. interesting observation. Yeah, so, so what you, from what you were just saying, and at least I'd like to hear your views on this. Yeah. You know, there's a balance there, is what oh, yeah. a, you know between the automation and the human, and getting that balance right. I'm I'm, I'm thinking there is, but you know, the, I, the older I get, one of my favourite answers to a question is, I don't know. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> when people say, what should the future model of an in-house agency be, for instance, mm -hmm. you know the. You know, I don't know, but I know it should be different from where we came yeah. from. And there are things I, I bet you do a lot more. You've done a lot more in house because you've been able to yeah. at pace yeah. than you would have been and, used to at HSBC we've had to because of cost. Yeah, exactly. As well, you know, yeah. we, mm. we we need to be more creative. Yeah. Um, keep our costs low. Be quick. I mean, the the other point to sort of counter the partnership piece is I also think you need to be a lot quicker these days. Yeah. So um, you know, I think being able to scan and constantly have your eye to the external world in marketing um, is absolutely critical. What's going on? What are the topical things that you need to be a part of as a brand that represent your brand? 
Um, and, and being able to market in that way, I think, is very different to where we were. We're not so much of a, you know, ma marketing 10 years ago, we're still in very much in a tell mode. Mm. Now we've mm. got to engage, we've got to be part of the conversation. That's a very different world to be part of than, um, you know, I do my nice ad and I push it out yeah. there and yeah. everyone believes it. Because no, that's it not how it works anymore. No, but I do think at the same time, you've got to be careful not to catch that disease, bright, shiny itis. Because <laughs> there are. Uh, but you've uh, got to know what you uh, stand for yeah, yeah. and then be true to what you stand yeah, and for. And also, you've got, because there are an awful lot of dodgy metrics around, particularly digital media, that, you know, mm. we should be questioning yeah. and be tough on. Um, but I do, you know, I think what's changed about marketing since I started is the speed of the food feedback loop and the number yeah. of channels available. Yeah. That's dramatically different. The fundamental disciplines of it pretty much the same. They do have to yeah. be speedier and scan. How do you scan? I mean, how do, how do you keep yourself up to speed with what's going on? Cause so we get out a lot. Uh, we talk to lots of people. Um, we are scanning social media. Uh, we are constantly listening to our customers and what they're saying about us so that we understand mm. what it is that uh, is important to them so that we can actually amplify that yeah. as well and go back to them on it. Um, and we, we do that on a constant basis. Um, and we have, you know, we have a couple of great agencies that we use. Uh, we don't use a lot, yeah. but if we, if we want to go out with a, you know, a bigger idea, then we will, yeah. we'll, we'll do that and we'll engage externally to yeah. help us do mm. that. Uh, but, but generally, you know, we are, we're listening to customers. We know what it is that's important to build our brand and that sort of informs our communication yeah. suite. Fantastic. Mm. And, and given that, we, you know, I think we, we, we're all talking about a world now where the speed of feedback is, is, is fast. You want to take, you automate if you can to, because again, you want to, you want to mm. eliminate errors and so on and so forth. Have you noticed a change in the type of partners that you would engage with for, 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 the, for the marketing function? Uh, have they changed in nature in terms of their skills? Because ultimately, we're talking here about new partners and different mm -hmm. partners to create new products and services. Have you have you noticed in the world of digital, if I can use that word, um, a change in the way that you're approached by your by your partners? Yeah. Um, sorry, you were gonna. I was just gonna say. I, th I think um, in terms of marketing partners, I, not not that we've sort of actively sort of got into it this because a lot of um, our activity is done in-house mm. but the changing landscape I see is there's so many more freelancers out there yeah um, so uh, connected by the digital ecosystem exactly so you know if you need an image if you need a story if you need you know a nice piece of um, sort of visual artistry done then there's a whole load of networks that you can go to to actually get them, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to go, I need to ask my agency for that. So I think that there's a very different landscape of places where you can go to, to get different parts of your sort of marketing communications that just didn't exist, I would say, yeah. probably four or five years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you, if you did this same event, but stuck a couple of people running agency networks in yeah. front of you and asked them, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're going through even more they dramatic are. change. Yeah. So, Everything's changed. I mean, in the end, you know, I think you need you need to work with great people. They mm. need to yeah. charge you fairly for what they do. But, you know, we're very clear that we own the customer strategy. Yeah. We don't outsource that. No. We own the customer yeah. data. We don't outsource that. And increasingly, we're going to be able to do more direct communication with customers as well. And when we need external help, you know, can I write a good ad? Yes. Can I write a brilliant one? No. So, you know, will we need brilliant people? Yes, we will. Yeah. But the, the nature yeah. of that partnership is changing. Uh, and that, that's challenging for all concerned, but it's good, actually. And one, one of the changes there is indeed the need for transparency of cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that just as applies just as much at scale as it does yeah, it when does. You're, you're smaller. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other, the other interesting thing is you know, marketing, because of the technology, has been really driven much more into sort of marketing performance world. Yeah. So, you know, is your, you know, and, and you can measure most things, although not highly accurately, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, measurability and that uh, ROI on your marketing investment mm -hmm. has got much more focused, I think, within businesses because the expectation is, is it, if you're doing it in digital platform, then you can measure it and, th and therefore you get much more driven towards, I think, uh, getting a sales performance out yeah. of your marketing. 
I think the interesting debate, and that, you know, a, a lot of I think the commentary within the Im industry right now is the the role of brand yep. uh, versus marketing performance. And I think we've been driven far too uh, far down marketing performance route, mm -hmm. being very data driven, being very you know, and it uh, doesn't always come out very smartly to a consumer. Exactly. Versus sort of the nice engaging sort of brand communications, and I think you have to have a really yeah. nice mix of both because to build a brand you have to still build trust, trust credibility, what it is you stand totally. for as opposed to just flog a product. But you also I think you then have to define, so you know, I, it, internally I spend a lot of time going, when I say brand, I mean everything because yeah. mm. when mm. customers are a Cooch customer, yeah. it's the Cooch brand they interact with through whichever channel, whichever exactly. platform. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely everything because the problem yeah. that financial services caused itself in days gone by is brand was the fluffy stuff. You yep. know, there were those people yep. over there yeah. that did Marcoms, yep. and then yeah. there were these clever people over here that did product and performance. And yeah. actually, mm. they, they were both wrong, by the way, because I think it's always been everything, but the yeah. kind of forcing that and having everybody understand that. So every interaction, the, you know, the text that we might send somebody when they're overdrawn that's inappropriate given how yeah. long they banked yeah. with us is probably more impactful yes. than a brilliant piece of TV communication, yeah. but they're yeah. both equally yeah. important. Absolutely. Yeah, marketing is definitely widened as a discipline. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, actually being able to manage that end-to-end -end customer journey is equally important when you're managing your brand. Yeah. yeah. And I've often, um, over the last few years, seen a lot of dialogue and debate around the role of a, a chief marketing officer and the role of a chief information officer and how those two, those mm. two in, in many ways, given what you've just described, come together more and they're more dependent on each other in terms of Balancing both sides of that is something. Is that something you would have you were both experienced? Well, I think it depends. There was, you know, in your kind of preset of questions, there was one which I was pondering because in the end, you know, I, I report to our CEO Ross McHugh, yeah. and I sit on the executive committee, as does as do the other people that manage other bits, and actually we all have to work together yeah. to make yeah. it work. So this notion that somehow or another, you know, a person can own it all has always been. It What's the word weird. I'm looking yeah. for? Not an appropriate one to say on. Yeah. <laughs> no, give it clean. Give no, no, it clean. Yeah. No, but, yeah. but I do think the, you know, the, this is about having the confidence to know that mm. when, you know, a great marketeer should be customer focused, should be the mm. voice of the customer, should champion the customer's mm. needs, and you do that in a small company and a big one. Yep. And you have to have, you know, you have to earn the respect of the other people around the table. You shouldn't, you know, presume it. But interesting about marketing is that, you know, I'm sure our chief risk officer wouldn't particularly like me starting to opine on his risk framework. Everybody has a point of view yeah. on marketing, yeah, yeah. Yeah. always has done, always will do, and that's absolutely fine. <laughs> the thing is, you know, you need, you need people's expertise around yeah, the table. Exactly. You need different yeah. skill sets around the table. You just need to know, you know, part of the, the art of it all is knowing when to bring it in and when exactly. to ask for that expertise mm -hmm. to, to help you do that shared goal. Yeah. Yes, and it's, in, it's interesting when you refer to the brand first and then everything falling out of yeah. that, which, which must require huge amounts of collaboration in terms of well, to ensure that all hangs together and you don't get, which was one of my other questions, and I think in the, in the preset questions, was, you know, how do you ensure that the external and the internal work in sync and you don't diverge mm -hmm. rather than converge? around the brand. Yeah, well, again, I mean, I think that's, you know, good use of data, good yeah. use of marketing data, because the easiest thing in the world to create is a, a gap that you need to mind, which is, you know, the brand promise and the delivery. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. you know, yep. what you've got to do is over deliver and under promise. Uh, and <laughs> a lot of brand marketing was based on doing it the other way around, which is not right. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense. Culture as well, I yeah. think is absolutely critical to that. Yes. Um, it's what delivers on the internal promise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore, when you're looking at what you want your brand promise to be, your internal culture absolutely has to be aligned to that. And people internally need to understand mm -hmm. how those two things fit together. Yeah. Great. So we've got a couple of minutes left, and it's sort of flying by. But we've, 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 you know, we've sort of touched on some really key areas, security, mm -hmm. we've touched on data, we've touched on how important it is to manage you know, both sides of that brand equation and make sure they're in sync. So I suppose a question for both of you um, would be, you know, um, for you, what, what, what does success look like in the next five years in your, in your respective roles? You know, is there anything, any one or two things that really, you, you know, if you're looking back from five years back and you say, we did that, yeah. that you would, you would be really proud of and, the comp you know, you believe would really drive, you know, the mission? Well, I mean, you know, it, 
I'm sure you have the same kind of balanced scorecard that I do. So you know, if I look backwards, you know, we, we're, we're just we're proud as a bank of what we've managed to achieve in the last five years. You know, we've turned mm. it around. It's safe mm. and secure. We're back again. Now the next five years are all going to be about customer focus. So you know, we need delighted customers. Mm. Uh, I'd love us. You know, it says on the top of our strategic triangle, number one for customer service, trust, and advocacy, and some of our brands and segments we're there so Coots is yep. doing a great job but in others we're not I would like us to get there and actually the the thing that hurts us uh, working in the bank we work in is where we sit in the CMA tables the competition markets authorities so mm. I'd like some forward motion in there and if we've gone up two places every year between now and the next time we sit around that would be great <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. but you know really I think that all boils down to making sure the customer gets real value from their relationship with us and and if they do that then they'll advocate for us and we'll be successful okay. I think for me um, you know our, our vision as I said at the beginning is to you know to build the world's most customer centric bank um, what does that look like for us um, uh, you know, you have to put your customer right in the very, very centre of that bank. And so being able to um, utilise data to be mm. incredibly useful for the customer and add monetary value to the customer, uh, but equally to have a bank that's designed around the, the customer choosing yep. how they use you, yep. rather you rather than us pushing what we want to give them um, is what success looks like, I think, at Atom is that the customer truly is choosing how they use us and being able to get value from that. Great. And you know, there's one or two uh, themes coming out very loud and clear from both of you, which is around this customer centricity, yeah. how you organize around that and give the customer the choice of channel and the choice of product, whilst ultimately still tying it back to the overall brand, which, yeah, is, which, is, which is really good yeah. to hear. Yeah. So I would like to thank you both um, for, for, for being here today. David, thank you for dashing across Thanks town, <laughs> London, London traffic uh, permitting. So um, just, just as we wrap up, the, the recording of this session will be on the website uh, immediately after this. So it, it goes without uh, further ado to say thank you, both of you, for joining DXC for, and The Telegraph for this session. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks Pleasure. very much. Cheers. Pleasure. Thank you.